So in this video, I'm going to explain um, Deniger's uh, conditional proof of the Riemann hypothesis. To start, I need to talk about zeta regularization and, and regularized products. Okay. So I'm going to give a definition. So let theta be a linear operator on a vector space. Okay, and it can be it'll it's possibly infinite dimensional. Okay, we're going to define to be equal to the sum from j is equal to 1 up to infinity of lambda j to the negative s. Um, here, uh, so these these guys at lambda 2 and so on, so this, these are the eigenvalues of lambda, uh, of, or sorry, of, of theta and um, we're going to denote the, the eigenvalues, so this is going to be the point spectrum of, of this operator theta. Um, we're also going to assume that uh, theta, all, all these are going to appear with multiplicity 1. Okay, so uh, definition. So I, I, this definition, I, let me just say this, so a regularized product or a zeta regularized product um, is this is just this formula. So I'm going to define an, a product of an infinite number of things. So uh, it's going to be defined to be the exponential of negative of zeta theta prime at zero. And so this is done by analytic continuation in general, analytic continuation. Um, here I guess you don't need these to be uh, uh, associated to an operator, but I mean you can just take like a sequence of, of, of complex numbers and this will work. Um, Alright, so let me give you an example. So uh, if we just have a finite number of these, so let's say they're for some other operator A, okay, then say a prime of S is equal to, so we just have this, uh, you take derivatives of these powers from calculus, okay, and this tells us that um, we have the following. So when we plug in zero, and so when we do the regularized product for a finite number of things, we're gonna find that uh, this is, okay, so we take the definition. We're gonna find that So minus minus log j. So we have x to log. We find that this is just the product. Okay, so this is some generalization of the product. Um, uh, so we recover the other things. So in and so uh, if we have an unbounded operator, um, then So if we, yeah, so if we have an operator on an infinite dimensional space with eigenvalues, say simple eigenvalues, we define this regularized determinant to be this regularized product of the eigenvalues. So this is the regularized determinant. Okay, so now um, 
Uh, now that we have this set up, I now want to talk about what is what I really want to talk about was this uh, the uh, so the cohomological interpretation uh, logical interpretation of the Riemann zeta function of zeta s. So this is the Riemann zeta function. Okay, so um, let me just say, give you a definition. So zeta hat of s is going to be defined to be zeta of s pi to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, uh, 2 to the minus 1 half. Okay, so this is kind of a normalization factor coming from certain regularized products. Um, uh, this part here uh, gets rid of the trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So the trivial zeros are at the negative even integers. Okay, so um, so let me give you a theorem now about this guy. So this theorem is due to uh, Denninger and uh, Soleil and Schroeder. And this is in 1994. Uh, so the theorem that they proved is that this guy here is equal to this regularized product of, so now we have this function here, okay. So here, this is the regularized product of uh, over th this. This is a product over zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So these are the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, and then we have these these two factors here. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to we're going to take a, a little break from this for a second, and then we're going to come back to this. Um, but. It, I want to explain how this looks like it's coming from cohomology. So let's recall um, the what the, the strategy for proving the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over finite fields. And this this strategy involved what was called a, a, a Vey cohomology theory. All right. So what was a Vey cohomology theory? So what we had was we took, we were looking at schemes over this finite field. So Q is a power of P and we were looking for a contravariant functor to graded commutative rings so over uh, a field of characteristic zero so this is takes so this actually takes projective schemes and characteristic p to graded rings and characteristic zero so here we're going to associate to this a cohomology theory and by this we have a direct sum, and the direct sum is over the integers here. Um, by graded commutative, we mean that um, alpha times beta has um, is equal to negative one to the degree of alpha times the degree of beta uh, times beta times alpha, and and uh, when we actually interpret this, this will be uh, the cut product in cohomology. Okay, so again, uh, they conjectured this, the, the, this, these axioms that I'm going to write down, and um, but Groth and Deke made this precise. So let me make a little division here. Um, so the first thing that this cohomology theory has to satisfy is finiteness. So uh, so this thing is. Uh, H i of x is finite dimensional. So it's a finite dimensional k vector space. k is in characteristic zero. 
So it has some vanishing. Okay, so this means that the cohomology is going to be equal to zero when i is less than zero or i is greater two times the dimension of x. Okay, so another property we have is this Poincaré duality. So Poincaré duality says that there is a perfect pairing. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, well, yeah, so let's see this. Hi of x, h2 to the n minus i of x goes to uh, k. Okay, and what it does, it takes alpha and beta. So there's a perfect pairing. Okay, so to the trace. So there's actually a trace map. In addition, there's a trace map from top cohomology uh, to uh, so n here is the dimension of x. Trace of alpha times beta. Okay, so this goes from here, and this is here, and so this is a, a perfect pairing. Okay, so there's a Kunith formula, which is another isomorphism like this. It says that um, the Kunith formula says that uh, h bullet of uh, x cross y is isomorphic to, so the graded rings of the product is the product of the graded rings, and so uh, you have to, uh, so, yes, you have to define what the product of a graded rings is, so a graded rings are, so you have to sum up the graded pieces appropriately to get the graded piece of a tensor product. Okay, in addition to these axioms, there is uh, some uh, there's other two other conditions, so there's some compatibilities. Uh, right, and then there's some Lefschetz axioms. So these are maybe the there's this there's this hard and weak Lefschetz property, and uh, there's a cycle map. Okay, talking about these is like a black hole of conversation. We could talk about these for a very long time and go blue in the face. Um, uh, so the the important thing to get from this is that, uh, and maybe maybe I'll do a video of this one time, is is that from here we get the Lefschetz uh, fixed point theorem. Okay, um, from from these compatibilities. From here. Um, we we get uh, so you, this is what delete okay so if you have the the, the hard Lefschetz uh, uh, property you can prove the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over finite fields. Uh, Deline actually proved the Vey conjectures and then proved this. So um, okay, but there's other okay. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, in the in what we're gonna say in the future. These, these are going to change a little bit, and then these become a little bit more mysterious. Um, all right. So let me... Let me go back to um, uh, our, our cohomological interpretation of, of this, and we will come back to this in a moment. So here we are, and now I'm going to kind of recall the strategy for um, so the strategy for the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over finite fields. Okay, so we have we're going to write the zeta function for varieties over finite fields. Okay, let's say that uh, x, so here, we're actually we're just going to write it like this. So we have a product, 
from w is equal to 0 up to 2 times the dimension of x of a determinants. So, so 1 minus t f w negative 1 to the w. Okay, so if I've done things correctly, uh, the Okay, so what plus one, I think. Okay, so the even stuff needs to be in the denominator and the odd stuff needs to be in the numerator. Okay, so we have this alternating sum. Um, in the case that um, uh, for curves, okay, so it's one dimensional, this becomes F H one. Okay. Let me say something else about the Frobenius here, this, this f, uh, 1 minus t f h2. Okay, so uh, this comes from the vague homology theories in the, in the Lefschetz formula, okay, so the, uh, so the, the trace formula. Um, So what I want to say is that this Frobenius, this is what I wanted to say, the Frobenius here, okay, so for varieties over FQ, there's a Frobenius that's, that's always acting, okay? And um, this Frobenius, since, it's, since we have a, a the vague cohomology is functorial, it induces an action on cohomology, and then you can look at, um, uh, say, the, the characteristic polynomial of this, or this modified characteristic polynomial. Okay, so um, okay, so let me. So what Denninger's strategy is is here. This looks very similar like this. So we're going to want this to look like determinants, but we need to modify the cohomology theory that we're going to use. And I'm going to do that now. Now I'm going to I'm now going to describe uh, Denninger's cohomology theory. So now this now is Denninger. Okay. So now we're not going to actually have schemes. There's going to be something crazy going on. This here is replaced by schemes. So we need some other category. So in 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 uh, Denninger's theory to each projective scheme, um, and this is could be an arithmetic scheme. We're going to need to associate a site, um, a different site. Okay, and this site could be considered as schemes over F1. It doesn't necessarily need to be a site. It could be something else, right? There, like vague cohomology theories, there's probably lots of different ways to do this. Here. Um, we're going to have uh, greater commutative rings over the complex numbers, not over over um, a k now. Okay, uh, these axioms are pretty much the same. Um, well, except for this one, it's no longer finite dimensional. Uh, this is going to be a Frechet space, and so this is a Frechet space. So these are function spaces. So infinite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, uh, the vanishing is still going to hold. There's still Poincaré duality, and there's still a Kunith formula. There's going to be a, a much more complicated version of these, these compatibilities and Lefschetz axioms, which I'm, for at our level of precision, we don't need to talk about this right now. But maybe I'll talk about this later if I'm like feeling like it. Um, and um, Ah, the, okay, in addition to these properties, we're going to have some new properties, okay? So, as I said that there was a Frobenius acting on varieties of finite fields, um, this, uh, these sites associated to schemes, or, in, 
or our Akalov schemes are going to be have a real action. So these are some new things. So there's going to be a real action of um, uh, uh, so there's going to be and this is going to be acting on uh, elements of here. Okay, and so this is what's going to be replacing the Frobenius, and so that then there's going to be a, a Hodge star operator. So the Hodge star operator goes from HI to H 2N minus I. So N is again the dimension of, of X over F1 and um, uh, And uh, this this Hodge star operator is going to lead to uh, an inner product, and this thing is going. So this is now um, here. This is ne now it's going to have some complex conjugation involved in it. Okay. Uh, I guess one last thing I should say is that these Lefschetz axioms these are related to. The new Lefschetz axioms, the new versions, so for the Denninger cohomology theory, uh, these are related to the so called explicit formula. Um, in, uh, for the Riemann hypothesis. And so th these explicit formula are the, the things that you get, that you things that you use in order to prove the consequences about the prime number theorem. Okay, let's go back to our cohomological interpretation of the Riemann zeta function. Okay, so let's go back here. From the real action, action, and let's call this phi on, on the object. So this is going to be a zeta function associated to uh, some compactification of the integers or spec of the integers. So to the real action we're going to have some infinitesimal generator. So theta is defined to be equal to uh, so the limit as t goes to zero of phi t star minus the identity divided by t and so this thing is going to act on this cohomology theory of Denninger and since it's a derivation, it's go uh, sorry. Since it's an infinitesimal generator, theta is a derivation. Okay, so now Denninger's conjectures are that this thing is actually one of these regularized determinants. So that this thing is actually looks like this. S minus theta over 2 pi on H0. Exactly like in the, well, the Ramon hypothesis for varieties over finite fields. Now we have this interpretation, this cohomological interpretation of um, the zeta function for varieties over finite fields. Given this formula here, we have some expectations. What do we expect? So we expect theta to act as 0 on H0. We expect theta to act as the identity on H2. And then given all the complicatedness of uh, the variety of the the zeros, the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function, we expect theta to be crazy on H1. Okay, so um, also in addition to to this, in order to prove the, the give the conditional proof of the Riemann hypothesis, we need to assume 
that theta and the Hodge star operator commute. Okay, so I'm going to refer to this in the cohomology theories as Denninger's conjectures. So now I'm going to give the conditional proof. We are now going to give Denninger's conditional proof of the Ramon hypothesis. So here's the claim. Assume Denninger's conjectures. One, define this operator A to be equal to theta minus a half. Okay, this thing satisfies Uh, this uh, anti-symmetric condition. Two, if you have an anti-symmetric operator, this implies that the eigenvalues of A are purely imaginary. And the third thing that we claim is that this implies that the eigenvalues of theta have real part equal to a half. This proves the Ramon hypothesis since um, we've cooked up the situation so that the eigenvalues of theta are equal to the zeros of uh, the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function or the zeros of the regularized uh, Riemann zeta function. So let me give a proof now. So assume f and g are in h1, okay? Then we can take the cup product of f with the Hodge star applied to g. This is an element of h2. So theta acts as the identity on h2. So we have this equality here. Theta is a derivation. So this is uh, so this is this, and we also know that uh, theta and the Hodge star commute, which gives us this formula. Taking traces, we have that the inner product of f and g look like this: the inner product with the derivatives. Like so, and uh, now we can we can manipulate this expression. So we're going to break up this into two pieces, two halves, and I'm going to subtract this over to the other side. So this tells us that one half f g minus f theta g is equal to uh, theta f g minus one half fg. Well, this side here, this is equal to f, and then we have one half minus theta applied to g. And this side here, well, this is equal to theta minus a half f G. Or in the terminology that we gave, the notation that we set up before, this says that AF G is equal to negative F A G. And this proves this anti symmetry. 
So now I'm just going to recall this basic linear algebra and conclude the proof. Okay, so so suppose that uh, we have a u is equal to lambda u, so we have uh, u is an element of h1, and u is not equal to zero, then uh, we're just good to check that uh, lambda absolute value of u squared, so this is equal to uh, uh, lambda u u like so, and this is equal to a u u, right, since it's an eigenvalue, and now the skew symmetry comes in, and this is equal to negative u, and now we have uh, lambda u, and this is negative lambda bar u squared. So now this is, uses the fact that we have this inner product, and now the, where the complex con conjugation com gets involved. This implies that lambda plus lambda bar u squared is equal to zero, or is, is equal to zero, which implies that 2 times the real part of lambda is equal to 0, which implies, of course, that the real part of lambda is equal to 0. So uh, lambda is purely imaginary, as we wanted. So the final part, so suppose that theta u is equal to lambda u, then one half plus lambda, or one half plus theta of u, so this is a. So a is, um, Okay, so let's redo this. Um, sorry, I made a mistake there. So uh, suppose this, then uh, take theta minus one half of u. So this is equal to uh, lambda uh, u minus uh, u over two, which is just lambda minus a half over u. Okay, so now this tells you that uh, lambda minus a half is, this is an eigenvalue for a, so this is a of, uh, of a, and this is an ir. So this tells us that lambda is an element of one half plus ir. Okay, this concludes the, the conditional proof of the Roman hypothesis.